I guess our, the thing that we really want to achieve is to help people manage their pain potentially in the long term and live as well as possible with pain. We also want to help people minimize their pain as much as we can, so we focus a lot on diagnostics and trying to understand pain. And when we drill pain down and start to really understand it, we can see that there's potentially lots of different mechanisms that gives us kind of little angles in on managing pain. Because as many of you will know who are living with pain every day, it's not something that's simple. It's not something that one um, kind of magic bullet will fix. And so really that's what we're here for tonight is to try and discuss that and to try and uh, understand a little bit more about how pain works so we can all individually um, kind of maximize our own pain management. As Becky said, we're going to be uh, doing a kind of card-based system. So if you've got questions, please scribble them down and people are going to be circulated. So stick your hand up if you've got a question and people will circulate and they'll collect the card and we'll, we'll do the questions later. Mark, can I have to get the first yes. slide? Thank you. I feel really weird, Mark's my slide <laughs> first tonight. I'm normally doing it myself. So anyway, so the, the session objectives uh, tonight are for, for myself and, uh, and also uh, Graham and I are kind of going to going to talk away through this, is to understand and look at how normal pain works. Then we're going to look at the nervous system, how that can maladapt and make pain stay. We're going to focus on what makes our pain, what are the ingredients that kind of um, make up our pain, and also uh, how our thoughts and feelings can change the intensity of pain and the impact of that. And uh, that can give us sometimes little ways into managing pain. Thanks, Mark. The really important thing is this is what pain does, and we know that this is what it does. Everybody who is, um, who is involved in pain and who is experiencing pain knows that this is what it does. So, we're going to do an example. We're going to start off our session kind of doing an example. Um, um, does anybody do DIY? Yeah, stick your hand up if you do. Hopefully not the injured hand. Stick your hand up if you do DIY. One or two people. I've kind of put a tentative hand up because I, I don't do DIY, DIY much. But anyway, you can imagine we're doing a bit of DIY, we're hammering a nail in, okay, to a wall. And if you like me, you, you might be a bit clumsy. And so we're going to hit our thumb with our hammer. What goes through our minds just at that point? Anybody? <laughs> swear words, yes. I'm glad to the swear words. What, goes through, what else goes through our minds? Ow. Ow, yes. <laughs> Anything else? Expletives. Sorry? Expletives. Ex uh, exactly, Ex expletives, yes. Do we feel the pain straight away? No. We don't, do we? Do we know that we've done it pretty much straight away? Mm -hmm. yeah. We do, don't we? So somehow there's a bit of a lag there. And that really is explained by our nervous system works on, I don't know if, if there's anybody kind of, yeah, my age, broadband and dial up for internet. Do you remember this kind of old modem which kind of like kind of hisses away when you dial up on your on your modem? Basically, the connection is really slow in the pain system and it's quicker in our normal nervous system. So that kind of explains why we can feel it happen, but we don't feel the pain straight away, because it's chugging its way along our nervous system. But it gets there. So anyway, we've hit our we've hit our hand, we know we've done it, and we've kind of had a few expletives. What else do we do at that point? We recoil them, there's a reflex in there. That's our kind of physiology kicking. What else do we do? See whether you're bleeding. Yeah. Say again? See whether you're bleeding. See if you're bleeding, yes. Anything, there's something over there. Stick your thumb in your mouth. Stick your thumb in your mouth, exactly. Cold tap, anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why do we do these things? Make it feel better. Make it feel better. Exactly. Because kind of mother nature tells us that if we do these things, then it kind of makes it feel better. And we'll drill down the physiology a little bit of, of that now. Oh, where's the next one? Okay, so if we're looking at the body's senses, we've got the posh words, there we've got mechanoreceptor, thermoreceptor, and chemoreceptor. The mechanoreceptors are the mechanical senses in our body. They sense movement, they sense, sense pressure, and they're kind of divided up into kind of really low threshold ones that will just trigger anything. So an insect crawling over the skin will trigger a low threshold receptor. And then there's the really high threshold ones, which are kind of like the Steven Seagal of our receptor group. And they'll only kick in like the Marines, they'll only get mobilized when it's really, it's hitting the fan. And so if we get like really knocked or really banged, 
and we get those receptors kicking in. And there's anything in between. So the whole dynamic range of receptors. And it's the same for our thermoreceptors. They'll sense whether it's within the normal operating range for our tissues. And they'll just give a little bit of information to our brain if it's nice. If it's way colder or way hotter, they'll fire away. I don't know if you've done anything like that. I've done it. I should learn from this, but you stick your hand on somebody's kitchen, uh, somebody's oven and when you go to a kitchen party, and like you kind of recoil really quickly. And that's again, that's our reflex system, that's telling us that there's something happening in our periphery that may threaten us and may damage our tissues. We go at the bottom, they're chemoreceptors, and they're kind of our chemical system, and that's kind of our primitive one from when we were creatures in ponds, and we have to be able to sense what's going on in the, in an, in an environment. And so we move away from that environment if the chemistry is different. We don't use those so much now because we don't really exist in ponds too much now. Um, so that's kind of how our sensors work. And they'll send a message, finger, they'll send a message down these nerves, and the nerves will plug into our spinal cord, which is obviously in the centre of our back, and they'll send a message from the spinal cord up to our brain. Mark, you want the next point? So the posh word for sensing pain is nociception. And this is the body's way of presenting information about a potentially threatening situation to our brain, to our nervous system, to consider it a bit more. And that consideration may be, yeah, it's okay, it doesn't matter, it's not really going to threaten us. Well, that could be a, you know, this is really, really damaging, this is terrible, and we need to get out of there. It may be really threatening for us. So that's kind of what our brain does in deciphering this. Can I have the next one, Mark? Now... The really important thing about how we understand pain, and I guess we've moved a lot in the last 10 years, particularly with pain research, is our nervous system is the main thing that generates pain and that, that we appreciate pain with. We kind of we understand our pain, we feel our pain just within our nervous system. And you need a brain to feel pain, because our spinal cord, which is the filtering mechanism which we talked about, that sends the information up to the brain, that doesn't feel pain. It just sends noughts and ones. So it sends data up to our brain. And it's our brain that's the really important thing that kind of understands what's going on. Now to do that, all that sensory information goes into the brain, but it combines it with a lot of cognitive information about what's going on at, at that time. Now, I don't know if you can see this, because the writing's a bit small, but it's about our beliefs, our knowledge, it's about our expectations, and whether this signal that's coming into our nervous system represents a threat to us. It's about social work, that social, our work environment, cultural factors associated with the sensory information that's going in, our previous experience, which is dead important, because if we perceive that what information we're getting sent and the sensory information that that brings is going to damage us, we condition, our nervous system conditions itself into generating more of a pain response. So, all of those factors there generate meaning to our pain. And they can generate either expectation or they can generate anxiety, may or may not do. But they all combine for us to then appreciate what our pain is. So you can see that our pain in normal circumstances is a combination of sensory inputs and a big long list of cognitive factors. And it's all mashed together. And the output of that will be how much pain we experience. Does that make sense? Does that surprise you? There's a few shakes of heads here. I think it's, we're really starting to understand and drill down how neurophysiology works. And so I'll just go, go through that again. Our pain that we experience, whether it's acute pain from an injury, whether it's chronic pain and we've had it for 20 years, is a combination of sensory inputs from our spinal cord, which has got sensory inputs from all the nerves and sensors, and a mishmash of a big long list of cognitive factors that tells us what our brain is doing and what our experience is there and then, and that will decide how much pain we have. We've probably often heard of situations where people have been in kind of horrible situations, like an accident or something like that, and they might say, I didn't feel pain at the time. I just needed to get out. And so if it was in an accident or, you know, whatever situation it was. And that's where our brain kicks in because it can prioritise stuff. And so all of that sensory information saying, do you know you've damaged yourself here and it could be something quite serious, that's irrelevant. We need to get out of that situation. So our brain kind of prioritises stuff and gives a response to say, I don't need to feel pain now, I need you to get out. 
And so it's only later on that all those things start to kick into place and we start to feel the pain a bit more. So, yeah, Mark, I'm going to explain this. So, let's go back to our example. We've hit ourselves with the hammer. That's all very interesting work done. We've hit ourselves with the hammer and we've um, put our thumb under the tap. And we said that there was um, this kind of, we, we'd stick it under the tap, we'd swear a little bit perhaps, we'd shout a little bit. Those are emotional kinds of responses to pain, the swearing and the shouting and the feeling really annoyed. But there's a sensory response to pain as well. If we stick our thumb under the tap, what kind of sense is actually Mark, can you go back? Um, yeah, that one there. We've said that we've got mechanical senses and thermo, thermal senses there. If we stick our hand under the cold tap, what ones are we stimulating by doing that? Thermoreceptors, yeah. I will probably stimulate a bit of mechanical receptor as well, feeling the hot water, on, uh, feeling the cold water on our thumb. If we were to clone ourselves and do two versions, one stick an hand under the tap and one looking at it, who do you reckon is going to have a more vivid pain experience? Second? The one looking at it. The one looking at it, yeah, exactly, because the reinforcement visually of I've damaged my thumb and all those cognitive things really are potent in driving those beliefs and expectations about our pain. Whereas if we stick our hand under the cold tap, we've got lots of other information going into our nervous system to distract our brain, like cold stuff, stuff hitting our thumb, and we may be looking out the window, looking at the kids in the garden, something like that. All of that information then is not allowing that pain program that's just started running any, uh, any uh, uh, time in our nervous system. So it's, kind of, it's about kind of distracting our nervous system a little bit. So, on the next one, yeah. So, let's move things forward to two days or so. What's your thumb looking like now? Swollen, exactly. What else? Black and blue. Yes, swollen and black and blue. But why does it do that? Because of the blood. Yeah, exactly. And protection, exactly. Protection. The swelling that we get in our thumb is a big inflammatory response because our body has got this amazing system, the immune system, and it polices what's going on in our body. And it swishes itself around in the blood, and it kind of checks everything through the police. It kind of just checks everything, patrols, and says, yeah, that looks all right, that's fine. And then when it encounters something that's injured, it says, Do you know, we're going to have to get something in there. We're going to have to call in the brickies, some structure, the sparks, some new wires, some nerves. I need to get the plumbers in for some blood. So it fixes it, and it coordinates this response. And that response is coordinated by chemicals and swelling and stuff like that. So there's a big, big building site going on there. We know that when that building site's active and all those chemicals are there, it stimulates, or rather it reduces the threshold for these sensors firing. And so previously those sensors, you'd have to give them a bit of a stoke to send the pain signal. But now they've got this chemical soup around them. These sensors are really, really sensitive. So you tap your uninjured foot, it's just tapping your foot. But if you tap your injured one, it's really sore because those thresholds have now dropped. So if we, yeah, if we move on, Mark, thanks. So the other bit of our physiology is what happens when we get into the nervous system. And this is a picture of our spinal cord. So these are the nerves that come into our spinal cord and they kind of sticks into our neck or in our back or wherever it is. And so these nerves kind of join in. It's a bit like a big kind of um, connection box of all these, these cables. And at that point there, the decision is made in the spinal cord. Do I stop this signal dead? Do I send it up to the brain? Or do I turn the volume up on it and turn it up louder? So over a long period of time, if that bit of our spinal cord is bombarded with signals, then that starts to get irritated and it starts to reduce its kind of thresholds and it starts to send loads of stuff up to the brain that it wouldn't normally send up. What do you reckon our brain would sense if that was the case? Anybody? Overload. Overload, exactly. So we get kind of pain overload in our systems. And so we get more unbridled information going into our, pain, into our brain. And our brain struggles to make sense of all that. It does its best, but it struggles. So this is what you would term the first bit of central sensitization. Central being central nervous system, so the spinal cord bit, and sensitization being 
it can't filter things properly. So it's sending up all sorts of information. Now, we can see that there's a kind of, these little slices of, these are bits higher up our spinal cord and this is starting to get to our brain stem. And these are bits obviously in our brain. So all these connections now are starting to feed into our brain and there's a big network going on. It's a little bit like a computer network. And if you look at these kind of posh scanners that we've got, kind of now in research, they can see how active the brain is in somebody who's had pain for a long time and somebody who hasn't had pain in that the brain is hugely active. It's like a computer network that's, that's alive, it's kind of lit up. And so it really highlights that pain doesn't just get into one bit of our brain, pain gets everywhere in our nervous system. And so we start to become more sensitive to things like noise, we can start getting sensitive to light. Normal stuff just doesn't feel right. So when we move, it just doesn't feel right. Sometimes we're a bit unstable, we just don't quite know where we are. And you can start to get remodeling within the nervous system, so our sensory system as a whole just doesn't function right. So as time goes on, all of these changes can occur over weeks and months. Okay, moving on. Um, now, we've talked a little bit about, about sensitization, and this is again important in things like um, osteoarthritis, because traditionally we thought osteoarthritis um, is a degenerative condition. Um, um, we now know osteoarthritis generally, it's, it's a repair of our body because the joints sense that there's little micro traumas going on in our joints. So it, it mounts this immune response as we talked about before, the injury response to try and heal it. But in doing that, in the little micro traumas of our joints, it sensitizes those nerves that are in the joints. So if you think of the little repairs that are going on over months or even years, those repairs can sensitize the tissues within the joints, so we can start to get joints, even if we, even kind of, um, even if they're, they're not particularly kind of irritated inside, the nerves have become sensitive. So that's one of the reasons why we sometimes recognize that we have chronic pain in osteoarthritic joints, not because it's inflamed, but because actually the nerves are more sensitive and more jangly. So what do we think a little bit about arthritis? Um, can you move on So. We've talked a little about the spinal cord, we've talked a little bit about, about the nerve, about the brain rather, and we know through, again, you won't be able to read this, I'm sorry, it's uh, the, the print is more, but there's, again, lots of studies that are showing that our brain becomes highly sensitized in response to injury sometimes. So uh, it says on here, osteoarthritis causes the central nervous system sensitization. We just discussed that. What else? Brainstem significantly involved in nociceptive pulse. And what that means basically is our brain stem's got a kind of inherent protection in it for pain and it kind of sends messages down to our spinal cord. And we just go back to the next one. <coughs> to this one here. We've got um, a system here, this, this, like, this green fibre, which you won't be able to see too long. But this green fibre, basically, it sends a message down to spinal cord to say, shut it off. I don't know. But in chronic pain, that system doesn't work very well. And so, we don't get that protection to our nervous system. And it's really important because this system here, the descending inhibitory system, that's where a lot of our drugs are targeted. So things like opioid drugs like morphine, if we don't have a particularly good sending inhibitory pathway, then drugs like that won't work. So it's, again, it kind of starts to explain why medicines have really limited use sometimes in the management of chronic pain. I'm going to, I think probably, Graham, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Probably introduce myself first. So I'm Graham, uh, one of the videographers who works in the pain clinic. Um, so yeah, just sort of carrying on. I suppose I'm going to talk a little bit around management more so, of sort of like the system of pain. Um, and sort of carrying on what Chris was talking about. I think when I see the system of pain, I think the big difference is that, like when Chris was talking around before, when you have an injury, I think the big thing with that type of pain is really consistent. So if you sprain your ankle, so you think about it every time you put your foot down, it's painful, until eventually once the tissues have healed, the pain goes away, and then you get on with life. And I think with that type of pain, it's relatively easy to deal with because even though you experience pain, you know there's an end point. But I think from working in pain for the last sort of five to ten years, I think the presentation of sort of consistent pain is completely different. And I think the thing that I sort of often see is that it's unpredictable. In terms of one day the pain can be okay and the next days it can be sort of really, really intrusive. 
and that can go from activities such as bending your back, you bend it one day, it's okay, the next day it's and that's incredibly frustrating. Uh, we think you see that really, really small movements hurt. So movements where you probably probably can't cause much damage to your body, but your system sort of amplifies the effect. And then you feel things like uh, pain changed quickly, not just with movement, but also emotions and how you're feeling. Uh, and I think the longer the pain goes on, I think the association between something structurally wrong with the body and pain, it goes further and further away. And I think I've put it on the bottom there, but pain, with persistent pain, it's no longer an accurate measure of tissue damage. But I think as healthcare professionals, especially myself, training as a physio, we were, we were sort of trained in this model. You found what's wrong with the tissue, you treat the tissue, the pain goes away and you get on with life. And I'm sure there was many of you who've sat out there and you've had some physio input, it tells for like two or three days, whether that's just things like acupuncture, massage, and I think, going back to what Chris was talking before, you're sort of, you're tricking the nervous system a bit. So when someone gives you a massage, you stimulate the, the mechanical receptors. So this, so less the pain receptors are sort of getting up to the brain system. So you're sort of tricking it. But unfortunately, that only works very short term. We know that pain is a lot more complex. Um, and I think... It's my job that persistent pain, and Chris is talking about what's happening persistent, but I then go a bit further. But when I see people who are sort of living with pain, these are the things what I see. I see that people sort of change how they move because it becomes incredibly difficult to move. You don't want the pain, it's a horrible, horrible place to be. So people can get a little bit frightened to move. So we don't bend our back, and then over a period of time, we become more deconditioned. And then it's sort of, as a consequence, you can't engage in activities of things what you enjoy in life. Um, and again, you can't do the things what you enjoy in life. Reduce participation and ability to work, physical, social, and it becomes, you can sort of see, it's just a building up, it's like a vicious cycle really. Um, and again, it can lead to isolation, reduce confidence. And I think what's really, really interesting when Chris was talking about when we're processing pain in that brain area, go to the next slide, that when pain goes on for a period of time, beliefs change over time. So you've had pain sort of 20 years and you have some what's going on in the head. From my experience, you don't say, oh, my nervous system's more sensitive. <laughs> often it's, I've got arthritis. <laughs> and the really worrying thing is often that's come from us as healthcare professionals because unfortunately, 10, 20 years ago, that's what we were thinking. But our change and how we're looking at pain has changed massively. So you say this, if, again, if it's, and I ask people, well, you think that arthritis is going on, and you ask them, well, this, the, the spine's crumbling, and I wouldn't move if that's going on. But hopefully, like what Chris is talking about, that is not the case. This is about the nervous system. And things like the brain, when it's sort of processing how much pain we experience, it looks at things like what's going on in your social life, how you're feeling, and over time, this just goes in a vicious, vicious, vicious cycle. And I think. We need to move away from sort of treating the symptom of pain by putting needles in it, by massaging it, by putting manual therapy, putting hands on people to sort of retrain this nervous system. Okay, so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to bring Chris back in now because as you can see, pain's really, really complex here. And the most important thing to start managing pain is the assessment. So if we, if you see that all the different things what can sort of influence pain, and we just look at one part of that picture, you're missing so many other things. So, and I don't know if you've heard of it, we talk about managing pain and biopsychosocial uh, assessment. Uh, I'm going to bring Tristan to talk about this. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah so, I think, you know, we, the, as we've said, that the kind of um, the thinking of pain has, has changed a lot over the last 10 years. And this, you may have heard this term, it's kind of used quite a lot biopsychosocial. It's, it kind of splits down to biological, psychological, and social. And it kind of feeds into what we've been talking about. But the biological bits really are to do with disease, to do with diagnosis, making sure that things are uh, fully understood. And I guess, as Graham said about osteoarthritis, you know, that's often one of the things that we put pain down to as clinicians. We can say, oh, yes, arthritis. Um, but we need to make sure, obviously, that there aren't any other conditions and there aren't any other things that are implicated in pain. And I guess that's the job of a diagnostician, like a, a specialist like Graham, 
physiotherapy or kind of, you know, from the medical side of things. Um, we know that some medical conditions make pain and um, things, uh, you know, kind of inflame areas, things irritate nerves. And so we know that all of those things occur, but we need to kind of understand how much of this is down to the biological bits and how much is down to kind of sensitization through those mechanisms that we talked about, our spinal cord, of our brain. That's one of the big challenges in pain because generally speaking, pain is a bit of a mishmash of all those. So our old kind of way of managing pain tended to be things like, as Graham says, put needles in it, trying to put steroids in or inject or medicines, this kind of thing. And again, it doesn't kind of, it's not the full picture given what we've been talking about. And so um, really what we uh, focus on a lot when we've understood the diagnosis is about kind of how our function um, can, can kind of play a part in our pain, whether it helps our pain, whether sometimes it can hinder our pain. And that's really how we kind of drill things down from the, the, uh, the kind of functional side of things, which is great, physios, yeah. therapists. So with the assessment, like Chris says, is that looking at the biology, of course, and making sure that... Sorry, off me. It's not the thing that's causing the pain, but a big part of the assessment is understanding the psychology, so understanding what sort of people's beliefs are, understanding what their cognitions are, getting an understanding of how they're feeling when they're in pain. Because how you're feeling with pain can amplify that effect quite significantly. And I'm sure you've all, if you've experienced pain at the times when it is tough, when you're having a bit of a downtime, pain will be intensified. And often, you might have not done anything physically to sort of increase the pain, and that's what you can see sort of quite regularly. Um, and also looking at the social aspect of it. So when you get assessed with pain, People will ask you about sort of what's going on in that other aspect of your life. And I think what sort of one of the things that for me as well, so I work in pain and work with psychologists as well. I think as physios, we always sort of come as we're the experts and stuff like that. And I think what I've sort of developed in the last couple of years is finding out what, what's important to the patient. Because what's important to every one of you living with pain will be different from person to person. So I'll ask most people in there. In my clinician, what are your best hopes of coming to the pain service? And I think most people will say I want to reduce the pain. But the next it's the next question, what's important? What will be different if the pain's less? And often that is sort of giving some meaning back in life, whether that's being a better grandfather, whether that's being a better son, whether that's being a better friend. And that that's become the target. Rather than sort of focusing on trying to reduce the pain, you have a focus, you have a direction. And often when people get engaged back in those activities, that normally has a good, pretty good thing to people's mood. And that can have normally have a positive impact on the pain experience. Okay. So, so, so as you can see, so basically the, the way sort of we're looking at managing persistent pain, it's about retraining this pain system. And I think we've, we've got enough evidence these days that the nervous system is, they describe it as plastic. They describe it as plastic and it's got its ability to remold itself. And you go back to that slide again to break it for that. Yeah. This is what sort of fascinates me. Expectations and consequences about pain. And I think living with pain, I think like you said, you've, you've probably heard it, people can become quite fear avoided or quite worried about sort of doing certain movements and become incredibly protective. So if you watch someone with back pain, if you watch them pick a pen up from the floor, often people avoid bending the back and the pen up the knees. But if you can create new experiences and teach people to move in different ways and do it gradually and teach people to do perhaps with less tension in the body and it's not as bad as you think, you can create new experiences. So when you do these new movements in the future, your brain doesn't see it quite as a threat. So you're reducing the threat and you're producing a safety mechanism. Can I jump yeah, in? Yeah, of can, Chris. Because <laughs> I can turn it down a bit even more. Because um, I think what... Um, what we've, there was a, a really interesting, um, there's been, well, there's been a couple of really interesting studies that focus on just what Graham said about kind of the avoidance of, of activity because we, you know, it, it's inherent in us if something's painful and we have to do it because it's kind of logic for us, really. But there's um, some really important studies that have shown even when we look at the image of somebody doing that, if, for argument's sake, you've got terrible back pain that's been with us a long time, even if we look at somebody else making those movements, it can increase the, the intensity of our pain. So it's really, really complex, this, about how we think about pain and how we perceive pain. It's fascinating kind of, you know, fascinating kind of physiology. If you're in the middle of it, it's not fascinating, but 
from the point of view of understanding how our pain works, we know that these factors are so important. And this is one of the reasons why we talk about retraining our nervous system, retraining the sensory side of things, because our, our brains not to kind of join those dots in a way that they have done previously. It's about kind of being able to do certain movements and not being, you know, not being in the same kind of um, concern that it's going to flare stuff up. And there's different ways of doing that, retraining the nervous system, which again, Graham's, you know, that's, that's, that's your expertise really going on. Yeah. So but what I'm going to do now is I think it's in a very short period of time to discuss like what's the magic way about managing pain. It's, it's incredibly difficult because it's it's really tough, but it takes a lot of courage from clinicians to try and help people with pain, and it takes huge courage for patients as well to sort of perhaps look at looking man, looking at managing the pain in a slightly different way. So from, I suppose in my mindset now, I'm going to sort of give a, little, a, a case study of someone who came to a our clinic about sort of 12 months ago and just talk about his journey to sort of how he was managing his pain and how we sort of changed perhaps the way he was managing his pain and this was a, a gentleman who came into our clinic and he was a 60 year old gentleman and he had a 20 year history of lower back pain uh, and what was really interesting I hadn't even started with an injury and I don't know I don't know how much people know about back pain but 50 percent of back pain doesn't even start with some sort of injury to the body but often we go from a system where we treat the back as it's injured, okay? So he got referred for an MRI scan and there was nothing sinister on it. He was told he was sort of like normal age-related changes, well, arthritis. Uh, and then his best hope to come into the service was when again he said to me, it's reduces pain. But that looked about engaging back in some meaningful activities like gardening. That was really good for him to relieve stress. That was to get out more and see his friends. But when he used to see his friends, he didn't think about the pain as much. Next time. So, I, so what was really interesting to me, I think the first thing I looked at is I asked him what 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 do you think's going on? And the things what he'd heard in the past, he'd been advised that he had arthritis. And asking him what that meant to him, his exact words was I thought my spine was crumbling. And, and by so yeah, so you can obviously think that is a huge threat going into his body. If if anyone's system thought that was happening. Your body, you're going to become more protective. You're not going to bend your body, okay? The things he did in response to that, though, he avoided moving his back. He stayed indoors, and his way of managing the pain was taking medication. That was his method. When I asked him what are your main strategies for managing this pain, it was medication. Uh, things he thought, things he thought, and what he believed. Well, in his mindset, he thought the pain he was experiencing, he was experiencing was equal in the fact that his spine is deteriorating over age. And eventually, within a period of time, I said, oh, well, where do you see yourself in five years? And he said, I see myself in a wheelchair. Uh, places he went, well, when his back pain flared up, as you think, his only way of managing his pain was taking his pills. So when his back pain flared up, he went to lay in eight because he was hoping they'd be able to give him more pills. And the people in his life, he, he, he was seeing a physiotherapist, he would see on a regular basis, and he would have a massage and then manipulate his back, and it'd give me very, very short term relief, two or three days of relief, and then he'd be back to normal. Uh, and the things happened in his body, well, not surprised, he, he felt really anxious because he said, you know, I've got no control over this. I've got no control. The only way I can control this pain is through this medication. Uh, I'm not surprised, and they said he was depressed because he was doing nothing in life what he enjoyed, the things that he previously enjoyed. So, so management, the first thing we did, we discussed his MRI scan, um, and we just, just told him, we said, yes, you have got arthritis, but there's been lots of recent studies, I don't know if people might, might be aware of this, but there's been lots of studies recently where they've actually, they've MRI scanned people with no lower back pain. So there was a study... 2012, we scanned 2,000 individuals with no lower back, back pain. And surprisingly enough, over the age of 50, 80% of arthritis. And these are people who are walking around with no pain. And I think that's fair enough to say is that it's a little bit more complex to that. And arthritis might not be the thing that predicts how much pain we experience. The things we did, we changed. We sort of said, well, actually, we exposed them back into actually moving his body. We did it gradually because we know 
it's about threat going to the system. So if someone living in pain, if you go and push them and do it too much, too much all at once, the system's going to see that as a massive threat and you're going to experience a massive increase in pain. But we did it really, really slowly. And we use strategies about control. What's one of the best ways to relax people are through breathing? So we use breathing exercises to relax them. And over a period of time, we did. We started moving. Can I just ask you something? You know, them 2,000 people who yeah. they tested and they didn't have, they had yeah. heart crisis, but yeah. they didn't. Don't you find that some people have very low pain barrier? I do, and some people have a high one. Yeah. Take, will you write that down? We'll answer that question. <laughs> and we will answer that question. You write it down and we'll answer that question. Yeah. Uh, things you believe. We asked the stuff what Dr. Barber talked about. We spent, we spent numerous sessions talking about the complexity of pain and how this is perhaps about the nervous system. And what was what I remember as a clinician trying to say, patients can't understand about pain, it's too complex. But there was another study what was done which was shown that patients can understand pain and knowing about pain can actually reduce threat and also can sort of improve the way people manage it. So we talked about pain, two or three sessions, actually more than two or three sessions, we took numerous sessions talking about pain. And over a period of time, as he improved his function, he was able to sort of expose himself back into going into his garden. And the good thing about going into his garden is that that was his way of relieving stress. And when we think about form, one of the things what lines up pain is stress. So we sort of counteracted that by getting back out into his garden. And over a period of time, he was able to get out. Uh, go to coffee with his friends and walk around the block and build up really slowly. And people in his life, what was really interesting is he brought his uh, he brought his wife to one of the sessions because he wanted to say, I want to get her on board with this as well. Because it's really difficult when you're living with so a loved one and you're in pain and perhaps they, they're not in pain. So he felt it was really important for his wife to understand it. And he said that was massively, massively important. Uh, and things happened in his body. And over a period of time, he felt less anxious. And I wouldn't say that this fellow was completely, he wasn't pain free, he still lived with an element of pain, of course he did. But he told me the big things is that, he said, I understand my pain a lot better now. I've been able to gauge back in activities what I enjoy. And he, and he, and he also says, I no longer have to go to AA when I feel my pain, because I feel I've got strategies I can do myself. And I thought that was really, really important. And I, I was doing this case study and I hadn't seen the fellow for a while. And, he actually ran up the clinic this afternoon and he spoke to our um, excellent secretary over there, Marilyn, and he ran up and he said, I went on my bike today, there's five miles on my bike. And that's, that, that's what it's about. It, it's about improving quality of life. If you can improve pain as well, brilliant and often you can, but it's about improving quality of life. And improving quality of life will have a real positive impact on pain. It really is. Um, can you call me? How long have we got there? Can you go back to the... Uh, uh, Chris, do you want to add anything on the case study? Oh. Uh, I think what strikes me, Graham said something at the very start about courage and about the courage to be able to do something different. And I think um, part, of the, part of the courage, I think, also um, has come from the clinician. Graham doesn't know probably what I'm about to say, but I think having the courage that Graham has as a clinician to be able to say, do you know, if we think differently on this, actually, we can we can work differently, we can get a different result. And as a clinician, sometimes we get so conditioned into saying, um, if that makes the, your pain worse, then it's the wrong thing to do. And it's so important that we know that sometimes the wrong thing is not the thing that flares pain, but it's not doing that, if that makes sense. And it's sometimes about getting the dose right of these kinds of things. So as clinicians, I think we often, as I say, get conditioned into, um, into playing it safe. And the safe option is not to challenge these kinds of situations. And when we don't challenge the, the pain system in this way, then we don't get through properly. And I think it's a, you know, he doesn't know what I'm saying. There's great credit to our brain. Uh, and, I, and I think what Chris is saying there, I think from a physiotherapy perspective, really speaking really honestly, I think if you look at the research, I don't think we've, over the years, we haven't done a particularly great job of managing yeah. things like lower back pain. We really haven't because we've been coming in from the wrong angle. And I think what we're trying to do now as a, as a, as a profession, we're trying to change the way we look at pain and look at things where what is flexible in people's lives. Our right is that what's going on inside your body from a structural perspective, unfortunately, we can't change a lot of that. 
But the things what we can change is the thing around the nervous system. And I think if you just go back the other step, yeah, because ultimately when I'm thinking about training management, I think it's about changing the stuff what's going into your nervous system, what suggests this threat going on and creating more of a safety message going on. And I think there's loads of different ways we can do this as clinicians, whether that's a physio, whether that's a psychologist, whether that's a doctor. But things we hear, like I talked about before, when we were explaining results of scans, sort of explaining in relation to what, how normal it can be for other people as well. So that can change sort of this threat perspective to a more positive perspective. I spoke to a gentleman this afternoon who was telling me about his pain and he went to A&E and was told really scary messages and he stopped moving. And then he heard about actually, we spoke to Dr. Bart, he spoke about pain in a different way and he was able to get on a different journey and a different path. Things you do, staying at home, only taking pills, that is threat to your system, creating a more positive thing, gently exposing back into exercise, learning about pain, like coming into these events. Um, Things you say, it's just age, it's just fibromyalgia, I can't do anything about it. But actually understanding the risk from the system can be sort of flexible. Um, things you believe, the pain is for that, it gets worse with age. I don't think that at all. I won't, I won't be stood here and admit that I do think pain is flexible. And pain does not. I think about a broken bone, it heals after six months. The pain is no longer in the window. Places you go, A and E will be back for you. Pain flares up, that is a danger message. Going to a dancing class with a friend, more positive stuff. Uh, people in your life, up to date healthcare professionals who understand about pain. And I know that it is changing. Now they do like back classes in here where they talk about all these great things and trying to change the way that you look at pain um, and things happening in your life. Making a plan, having goals, working with professionals. So you've got. I think psychologist said to me, it's a long day on the golf course that you don't know what you're going for. So you know what our goals are working and with uh, us as clinicians. So we're just finishing off now, fine. just my final thoughts. Uh, so I think, touching on what Chris said before, I think it, living with pain, I understand, is incredibly difficult. And to change the way we're sort of looking at and managing as a patient, I think it takes huge courage because... It's never a perfect path, path managing pain. It's never a sort of an upward trajectory. It goes up and down. But I think as long as we're going in the right direction and we're looking, we're trying to change the drivers of pain rather than the symptom of pain. I do think it's how we change pain. Uh, and I think as clinicians, as people living with pain, we need to change the way we look at it. So having these events and sort of spreading the word, I think, is massively important. Um, yeah, that's what Chris was talking about. So. I don't really have much else to, to, to say, really. Um, I think... Have a, have a think, and honestly, please, if there's questions that this brings up, and you kind of think, you know, I, I, I can see that, but, you know, that doesn't stack up for me. That doesn't explain things for me. Scribble it down, please do, because we will be looking at these questions as we go through the, this evening now, and we'll be looking at what we can kind of discuss at the very end. So, honestly, that's great feedback for us to be able to understand all the issues. But, um, but yeah, I think it's probably, probably break time now. Have a... Have a kind of stand or have a stretch and have a, a drink and have a wander around and just have a chat with other people. Thanks very much. Thank you.